Okay, I think we're coming up to time for the um, second set of parallel, parallel streams. So um, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A. If you want to make a comment to some or all of the people here, then put it in the chat. Um, so the first paper is quite a big collaboration. So um, so the three people involved are James Miller, who's a senior researcher in the Scottish Government's Office of the Chief Economic Advisor. Um, he's had policy roles across the UK in DWP and Social Security. And he's project lead for this uh, work stream on social returns of education. Um, Zoe Mackay is also contributing. She's a research coordinator at Skills Development Scotland. And Gilly, Gillian Wiley is an evaluation research executive within Skills Development Scotland. So I'm going to pass over to them to present. Um, we've got about 20 minutes with five minutes for questions. Uh, can someone let me know if that's showing his full screen? Looks good to me, James. Yep. That's good. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so to start us off then, I'd just like to set a bit of context for the work. So in Scotland, education is a devolved area. Um, so that results in a delivery and funding environment that differs a little from that elsewhere in the UK. Educational funding in Scotland is delivered through investment by the Scottish Government and also it's to enterprise and skills agencies. So those are Skills Development Scotland, which is a national agency that is responsible for delivering things such as uh, careers, skills and training services. And then also the Scottish Funding Council, who funds Scotland's further higher education institutions. And the Scottish Government and both of its agencies work together to support Scotland's education and skills system and also to uh, collect data and evidence to show that education funding is contributing to its various policy goals. And that's really what today's presentation is going to be focusing on, um, how we evidence the impact of education in Scotland um, and how we determine whether the funding from government and its agencies is contributing towards various policy goals and how uh, we've been using the APS to help us achieve that. So in recent years, uh, there's been growing policy and ministerial interest in developing a more comprehensive understanding of the outcomes from education and skills investment. And this ambition has been reflected uh, across various policy documents um, from Scottish Government over the last few years, such as our 15 to 24 Learner Journey Review um, and also our Enterprise and Skills Review. And it was recognised that the evidence base that's available to policymakers um, around the impact of education and skills investment could be better. We currently have a fair, if uh, slightly limited understanding of the economic impact of skills acquisition. And we do collect some um, evidence around non-economic outcomes from education for particular learner groups, such as modern apprentices. But large evidence gaps remain across other qualifications. And in general, we lack that comprehensive understanding of the total returns of education investment. In this, Growing demand for evidence on the return from education investment also sits alongside another area of interest, uh, which is wellbeing policy and the general move towards incorporating wellbeing as a key part of policy development in Scotland. So to address some of these evidence gaps, uh, the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board was created a couple of years back, um, and I'll refer to that as the ESSB from now on. Um, and the ESSB's objective was to align and coordinate the activities of Scotland's enterprise and skills agencies um, in government. And one of the metrics uh, the ESSB's efforts will be judged against is Scotland's ranking by the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development on various outcomes, uh, including equality, wellbeing, sustainability, and it currently sits mid-table for many of these. And the ultimate ambition of the ESSB is to develop that comprehensive understanding of uh, the returns of education investment, not just to uh, the exchequer and the, to the economy, but also to the individual and to society as a whole, um, and in doing so allow for more targeted policy interventions. So that's a brief summary of uh, the background to this work. Um, now, just to take a quick look at the breadth of the, the education and skills system in Scotland as it stands. So across the various universities and skills agencies, uh, Scotland invests around £2 billion per year in education, and that goes towards supporting 34,000 modern apprentices, 120,000 college students, and 140,000 university students. 
And the question then is, what is the impact of this investment on our various stakeholders, uh, who you can see on the, the right there, uh, be that society, individuals, employers, um, and also the universities and colleges um, and apprenticeship offerers. So our project takes a dual approach. Uh, we have two work streams that operate in parallel. Uh, the first one is our, what we call the economic work stream. So that's looking at the various economic returns. Um, and then the second one, which will be the focus of today's presentation, um, is our non-economic work stream, which looks at returns to individuals and to society at large. The project, uh, which began in 2019, set off with an ambition to understand all of the non-economic outcomes to learners in society. And we identified some of those outcomes through initial engagement with learners themselves, uh, and those were things such as confidence, improved health, um, and developing meta skills. Um, and we would do that by carrying out a social return on investment. So an SROI, which is uh, similar to a more traditional ROI, aims to identify, measure, and eventually value in monetary terms, uh, the non-economic returns from a particular policy or investment. As COVID-19 uh, took hold, it placed not only physical restrictions on face-to-face -face research, but it also posed an ethical challenge as to whether we should proceed with the work. Um, so the entire education landscape was, of course, changing very rapidly at that point. Uh, learners were experiencing a lot of uncertainty around their futures. So it was not clear that it would be ethically sound at that point um, to, to, to ask them about their futures. And of course, we could also see our responses to the research heavily influenced by uh, COVID and uh, no one knew at that point whether the changes that had taken place as a result of COVID would be temporary or permanent. So as a result of that, uh, a step change took place um, and the decision was made to pause the primary research and to temporarily narrow our scope to look at a measure uh, we could evidence using existing secondary data, and that was well-being. And that's really where uh, the annual population survey comes into the picture of the most readily available measure of well-being uh, within the secondary data sets that we had access to within that time period was uh, the APS. And the APS, of course, measures well-being using the four ONS well-being questions, uh, which are listed at the bottom of the slide, which cover uh, anxiety, happiness, satisfaction, and how well individuals uh, feel their life is worthwhile uh, across an 11-point scale. So this slide gives an overview of the data that we used as part of phase one. Um, as I said, the APS was the primary data source and that gave us a sample of just over 59,000 respondents. And there's a couple of caveats worth noting uh, for this data set. Primarily uh, that it was not possible to say for certain whether a respondent had completed their post-school education in Scotland uh, or elsewhere in the UK. So we had to use two rules to identify who to include within our sample. Firstly, if a respondent had any form of Scottish school level qualifications, uh, then we assumed that they would also complete their higher education in Scotland. And secondly, if a respondent had no qualifications at all, then we would include them in our analysis if their current residency was within Scotland. So as I said, those rules gave us uh, a sample size of around 59,000 respondents. Uh, and we analysed those respondents based on uh, three different levels. That is whether they did or didn't have a qualification. Uh, the second level was whether they had a school or post-school level qualification. And then the third level, uh, we broke down uh, qualifications into individual groups that we had sufficient sample sizes to analyse. Um, and also it's worth saying that we complemented uh, our data analysis with two additional surveys, though that's the Apprentice Wellbeing Survey um, and the Graduate Outcomes Survey. And these allowed us to look at wellbeing returns from two groups that are a little bit harder to isolate within the APS. Um, but all of the data that I'm going to be covering today will be from the APS. So now taking a look at uh, our APS sample, there's a couple of things to be mindful of as go through the results. So we can see on uh, this chart here, most of our respondents had some form of qualification. Um, however, around a fifth of our respondents had no qualification at all, which is slightly higher than what we would expect based on uh, Scottish education data. And then if we have a look at the age profile of the sample, uh, it tends towards older age groups with over half of the sample being aged uh, over 50 and around 80% being aged over 35. And when we consider that alongside uh, the second table up there, age finished education, which shows that most people finish their education before the age of 24, we can assume that uh, the majority of our respondents didn't acquire their qualifications under the current uh, education and skills system in Scotland. 
And then finally, there are some groups which are poorly represented uh, or not represented at all. So these include ethnic minorities. Uh, so white respondents were slightly overrepresented in our sample. And also certain groups of learners uh, that I previously mentioned that we can't isolate within the data. And that includes college students, uh, adult learners, care experienced people, that sort of thing. And understanding how we can incorporate such groups will be part of our uh, future phases of our research. Um, and then it's also worth saying that all of the data we're looking at is, of course, taken pre-coronavirus, so it doesn't take into account um, any changes to education since then, such as a move to online learning. And of course, at this stage, we're only able to look at uh, correlations uh, with identifying causal relationships will be uh, a future phase of the work. So moving on to the findings then. Um, so we started off by looking at the education and wellbeing relationship more generally. And this slide shows the relationship uh, between those who have no qualifications and those who have any. And we can see um, that those who have any qualification report higher wellbeing across all four wellbeing questions. And then again, when we break it down by level of qualification, um, we can see a slightly more mixed picture uh, with not a huge difference between those who have school or post-school level qualifications, um, but the difference between those who have no qualifications and any remain. And then finally, when we break it down by qualification type, we can see a, a slightly clearer picture starting to emerge, uh, whereas uh, as the SCQF level of the qualification increases, then in general, so too do your reported wellbeing scores. Um, and we can also see looking at the red line, which shows uh, the, the Scottish mean wellbeing score, that almost all respondents report um, above average uh, well-being with the exception of uh, post-school non-university qualifications so that's things such as trade apprenticeships who report slightly below average well-being so as part of the work uh, we also carried out a regression analysis to better understand the qualifications well-being relationship uh, and a green box here shows a significant positive association uh, a red box a significant negative and a gray box no association at all uh, and there's a couple of things worth highlighting so perhaps uh, unsurprisingly, those possessing any form of qualification reported improved well-being. Um, and for university qualifications in particular, however, uh, that showed increased anxiety over school level. We also found non-university qualifications um, have few significant correlations with well-being except for worthwhileness. And then finally, when we compare well-being outcomes uh, with the general Scottish population, we found that in general, as you get higher and higher levels of university type qualification, that leads to higher and higher well-being. In addition to looking at the education and well-being relationship more generally, uh, we also wanted to understand the benefits experienced by different learner groups, uh, which could, for example, help us target investment towards learner groups who derive less benefit from education. Uh, and the first group we looked at was by sex, and we found that for both males and females acquiring any form of qualification, it was associated with higher well-being scores compared to those without qualifications. Also, both males and females uh, were likely to report higher levels of anxiety if they had an undergraduate degree. Um, and then finally, female respondents tended to report higher anxiety than male respondents, irrespective of their qualifi qualification level, but they also reported higher levels of worthwhileness. And there could be many drivers behind uh, the patterns observed, some of which we touch upon in our uh, phase one report. Uh, but a couple of explanations could be these differences reflect uh, the difference in subjects studied by males and females. So we know, for example, social services and healthcare uh, are more female dominated areas and results from our other data sets suggest that that's a framework that is associated with higher levels of worthwhileness. Um, and also differences between subjects could also be linked to things such as labour market pressures um, and limited job opportunities within those areas. The second group we looked at was differences in learners across age groups, um, and there was slightly less differences here than by gender. Uh, but in general, older respondents tended to report higher well-being than younger respondents, um, and those aged over 50 reported in particular higher worthwhileness as their qualifications increased. There were also relatively few uh, statistically significant results for those aged 25 to 34, which suggests uh, potentially other factors could have a greater influence on well-being for that particular group. And then finally, almost all age groups reported an increase in anxiety uh, when moving from school to university or first to higher degrees. And then the final learner group that we looked at uh, was disabled and non-disabled learners. And we found that whilst people uh, with a disability reported increased satisfaction as qualification level increased, they still reported uh, lower well-being scores than non-disabled respondents. 
In fact, those with a disability appear to report uh, a larger increase in wellbeing scores between qualification levels than non-disabled people across all levels of qualification. However, the findings showed that those with a disability still reported lower well-being than non-disabled respondents, no matter what the qualification level uh, was, and also consistently below the Scottish average. And again, there could be a couple of reasons why these effects are being observed. Uh, it could be that the causal effect of education is greater on disabled learners, or it could be having a qualification is more meaningful for uh, people who are disabled. And again, further work um, in future phases will explore this in particular. But as I said, nevertheless, a gap in well-being remained between people who were disabled uh, and people who were not, which raises an important question as to what the skill system can do in future to support this. Um, and that's all from me. So I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, Zoe, uh, who's going to take us through some more findings, if you're there, Zoe. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, so we also looked at associations between well-being and other factors like degree subject choice. So in the graph on the left, we can see that respondents with a STEM degree reported higher well-being scores than those with an arts, humanities and social science degree across all four measures. And the table on the right shows the difference in well-being scores for those who study particular subjects uh, compared with the Scottish average. So we can see here that those who studied subjects like arts, languages and linguistics at university tended to report below average well-being scores while those who studied things like business and financial studies, medicine, architecture and dentistry reported well-being scores above the Scottish average for all four measures. Next slide, please. We also looked at the relationship between employment status and well-being and found that this seemed to vary by reason. So you can see here those who were economically inactive due to disability had some of the highest anxiety and the lowest happiness scores. Next slide, please. While you can see here that those who were inactive due to being retired had some of the lowest anxiety and the highest happiness scores. Next slide, please. We also looked at the association between well-being and income using the measure of hourly pay. So here we can see that those who earn more typically reported higher well-being scores, though with a slightly more mixed picture for anxiety. And finally, we found that those in receipt of any state benefit tended to report lower well-being scores than those who weren't claiming state benefits. And those who were claiming state benefits also reported well-being scores below the Scottish average for all four measures, which you can see um, in the table at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to sum up our findings, overall respondents with any form of qualification tended to report better well-being scores than those without qualifications. And from our initial exploration of well-being and qualifications, we've identified a few main findings. So in terms of age, the most statistically significant results were found for the 35 to 49 age group, suggesting qualifications might provide greater well-being benefits in this, at this age while the low number of statistically significant results for younger age groups might suggest other factors are more influential. In terms of gender, females tended to report higher anxiety than males across qualification levels, but also higher worthwhileness. And in terms of disability, uh, those with a disability reported poorer well-being scores than non-disabled respondents, irrespective of qualification level, and consistently below the Scottish average. But the fact that respondents with a disability tended to report a larger difference in well-being scores between qualification levels could suggest that having a qualification is possibly more impactful for people with disabilities, but further work would be needed to look at this in more detail. We've also looked at the relationship between well-being and other factors like degree subject and employment status with a few findings that I went through in the previous section. But just to su sum up the results, it's important we recognise that although we have identified some interesting trends, the research limitations to date don't allow us to establish a causal relationship between changes in well-being and gaining qualifications. But that's something we hope to be able to look at um, further in the next stage of the research. So I'll now hand over to Gillian, who's going to talk through some of our plans for the next phase of the project. Thanks, Zoe. OK, so I'm going to finish off by covering what's happening next for the project as we round off phase one and look towards what we're calling phase two. Um, so what we're planning is extending our approach to look beyond well-being to a range of other non-economic outcomes for both individuals and for society. 
So the blue diagram on the left shows the non-economic outcomes for individuals as a result of participating in education and training. And it includes things, so personal wellbeing, as James has went through, and also meta skills, which is skills needed for the future. Fair work, which is based on Scotland's fair work framework, and includes things like job security and fulfilment. Broaden your horizons, so that means people have a clearer idea about the opportunities that are available to them. And we've also included health, self-confidence and relationship with others. And then the diagram on the right shows the outcomes for society, which includes social attitudes, civic engagement, so that's things like voting behaviours, volunteering, productivity, inequalities, because we're aware that education possibly entrenches existing disadvantage in society, crime rates and health on a societal level too. So we've highlighted the outcomes in green circles that we believe the APS will be able to help us explore in the next phase. So these were created following a literature review where we found evidence of a link between these outcomes and education. And they were finalised based on their importance in current government policy, which were then subsequently validated by stakeholders through roundtable meetings and also a small number of engagements with current learners. And that was prior to the pandemic. So go to the next slide, please, James. OK, so how can the APS help us? So the APS allows us to explore the different pathways that are important to our project by being able to split by qualification type. And it's also got large enough sample sizes in Scotland for us to allow us to do this. It also contains variables that allow us to explore many of our outcomes of interest. And this is particularly true for fair work and health. And it also contains additional characteristics in the secure version of the data set that allows us to explore particular groups in society and also linked with geographical data such as Scottish Index Multiple Deprivation, SIMD, um, which will allow us to further investigate the relationship between socioeconomic status, education and social outcomes. Next slide, please, James. So how are we going to explore both the individual and societal level outcomes further? So there's a number of things that we're currently working on. Um, we've produced an evidence review and logic model, which maps all of our individual and societal level outcomes to indicators, and then what secondary data is available for us to explore each of these indicators further. And we've also highlighted any data gaps. So through that evidence review, um, there was two main data sets that we identified and that is understanding society and the APS. So we're currently exploring how a longitudinal data set like understanding society might be useful for a project and might also help us address the issue of causality that we've experienced in phase one. Um, and we've also just got access to the secure version of the APS and that will allow us to explore these outcomes by um, more characteristics than we had um, been able to do for our wellbeing analysis in phase one of the work. We're also having regular meetings with our expert panel, and this includes subject experts from academia, public and third sector, and we gain really useful feedback on our approach at these meetings. We're currently conducting secondary data analysis and also making plans for primary data collection. So that's to fill the evidence gaps that we identified in our evidence review, but also, to, also hoping to use some more qualitative research methods to further explore the issue of causality that we haven't been able to address through secondary data analysis. So I think that's it from us. Is that last slide, James? Yep, so thank you for listening and happy to take any questions. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, we might have a few minutes at the end if people have any more thoughts. Just keep copying them in the Q and A. Um, Bruno's presentation is is a, a video, so I'm just going to um, share the screen and put that on in a minute. So, um, hello everybody. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, listen to my presentation. Thank you to the UK Data Service for having spaces like this. Uh, especially for student, uh, students like uh, like me, um, having the chance to present our work, I think is the only way forward um, in our own research, having the chance to listen to feedback and comments from people that are more senior than us. So thank you very much. Right, let me uh, share my screen and let's start with the presentation. Well, now you should be able to see my screen. Um, I'm gonna be presenting uh, my work on inequality of opportunity in the United Kingdom. Uh, a supervised learning approach, more specifically um, a conditional inference tree. 
And now let's let me say before I start that this is something uh, this is work that I submitted for my dissertation, my master's of research dissertation here at the University of Glasgow, uh, almost five months uh, ago. Uh, this is not something that I'm working uh, exactly something that I'm working on uh, for my PhD. However, please, um, if you have any comments, if you have any feedback, um, I would be more than happy to receive them. So there's my email if you would like to drop me an email or uh, say anything at the end of the presentation in the Q&A session. Uh, so it's been a challenge to go back to uh, and see what I've done five months ago, uh, but I think it, it was a really interesting experience. Okay. Okay, a, a brief overview of how I'm going to structure my presentation. Firstly, I'm going to um, tell you what's my motivation of my, of my research in general. Uh, then briefly introduce the theoretical framework um, and the methodology that I use for this uh, empirical work. Afterwards, I'm going to present the data and the implementation of the algorithm. Um, I want to try uh, to be as concise as possible with the algorithm. Um, but again, if you have any questions, please feel free to, um, to um, let me know and I can address them at the end of the presentation. Uh, finally, getting to, to the results and what's the opportunity structure that I found for the UK. And again, briefly commenting on um, the performance of my model. So uh, the motivation of my research in general, uh, and I think most people would agree with me, um, stands um, around this um, sentence. So inequality might be one of the most important issues of the 21st century. Inequality uh, in any of its forms, so either income, wealth, education, or even healthcare, um, I think is more, one of the most um, relevant topics to be working on nowadays. Um, if we look at the trends of, on global inequality, uh, as most people would know, the between country inequality shows a decrease uh, in the trend. And this is uh, mostly explained by um, very poor countries like China or Vietnam growing at much faster rates than other rich uh, countries. However, the within country inequality um, shows a very different trend. And, Obviously, it depends on which country we're looking at. For, for example, for countries like the US um, or other or some European countries, um, the within country um, inequality has shown a, an increase, right? Now, specifically for the UK, uh, the dynamics again uh, are very uh, different depending on what we're looking at. So if we look at the net household, household income, so this is income after taxes and transfers, we see that there's indeed a decrease in inequality. However, if we uh, step backwards and only see um, the individual gross income, particularly uh, earnings, so that's uh, the, the income for um, the employed, we see that actually income inequality has seen um, an increase in the past 20 years or so. Um, now, this is in a nutshell what's motivating this particular work, this particular work, sorry. Um, so this is something that I like uh, debating um, about with uh, many people that I know. To what extent is the idea of uh, meritocracy valid? So we have people uh, arguing, um, okay, I, I am where I am today because of my efforts, and that's totally valid as well. However, uh, do we need to step for, uh, back and look at the, at the circumstances as well, like where you were brought up, where were you born, what kind of household uh, you had when you were uh, 10, 15 years old? So the question is, do circumstances matter uh, for, the, for the different attainments, either educational, um, occupational, uh, or income? So the recent question for this um, work is, are individuals in the UK constrained by, by circumstances? If so, which are the most relevant? And does income inequality, so, sorry, inequality of opportunity translate in, into income inequality? Now I'm gonna go back to these research questions at the end of the presentation and see, if we were able to address them or at least hint um, and shed some light on them. So the theoretical framework that I use for, for this work is uh, John Rummer's um, approach to equality of opportunity. Now, um, the main idea be behind this is that uh, people's attainments depend on both effort and circumstance. Um, so what an individual is actually held accountable for uh, will depend on these two. Now, I know that this discussion is very philosophical, um, so it's very difficult to draw the line and to actually identify uh, what an individual is uh, held accountable for and what not. 
And I think this is one of the main drawbacks of the theory. However, let's just take this framework um, and see what we can do with it. Now, the whole idea is that, um, so Romer put, um, put forward a principle of leveling the playing field. So um, let's, let's define a group of individuals with the same circumstances as types. Um, Romer's argues that we should be, as a society, compensating individuals that come from most uh, disadvantage, more disadvantages, more disadvantaged, sorry, uh, backgrounds. Okay, so from very low circumstance backgrounds. Uh, so in this sense, of course, an in, uh, for an individual, what matters is what how much level level of effort um, they put into um, their activities. However, for a society to compensate, uh, what matters is the degree of effort. So let me just put an example to um, identify what Romer is talking about. Let's say we have two different types of individuals in the society, uh, type one, and let's say I can actually um, measure effort on a scale from one to 10. So if type one of individuals um, present a distribution of effort that goes from, let's say one to six with a median of three, um, and then we have type two of individuals uh, with a distribution of effort that goes from three to nine with a median of five. Now for the society, for the society to compensate, um, we cannot just look at the level of effort and say, okay, people that were actually um, giving a level of effort of five should be getting the same rewards. This is not um, this is not correct. Why this is not correct? Because obviously, for someone of type one being um, much uh, uh, above the median of uh, effort within the distribution, signifies a lot more of effort than for type from type two. So this is just a, a brief comment on why we are looking at level and degree and not level of effort. Now, as I said before, the limitation of the theory, uh, first of all, is that, again, it's a, a largely normative approach. Um, so um, it's very difficult to actually, well, again, measure effort, measure circumstance, uh, and so on. Uh, and then, obviously, this is not a whole, a complete theory of distributed justice, uh, because it is not telling us um, anything about what are the circumstances that matter for a society and how to compensate for them? So again, I'm gonna just take this um, uh, frame framework as very normative and then uh, I'm ideally in, with this work, I'm just trying to identify what are the circumstances that the, the data is showing me uh, for the specific case of the UK. Now the methodology um, for people that are not very acquainted with regression trees is just a type of supervised learning. Um, it is supervised because I'm going to be inputting uh, covariates uh, to, to my algorithm. Um, and the whole idea is to predict uh, what the outcome um, for an individual is going to be. Now, I'm not forecasting unobservables. What I'm doing is basically splitting my sample into the training and the testing data sets. I'm fitting my algorithm in the training set, and then I'm predicting uh, the outcomes in the testing sets. Okay. Um, so ideally, uh, I would like uh, I would like to divide my sample um, uh, into non-overlap overlapping groups. So this is the whole idea of regression trees. Now, the way I can actually divide the sample and make the splits varies. Um, one would typically look into minimizing the mean squared error. However, um, I'm going to be working with conditional inference trees, which is more statistical in nature. And if you have a look at the bottom of the of this uh, slide, what I'm basically going to be doing is testing partial hip hypothesis for uh, distribution independence. So I'm going to take a covariate, condition my uh, distribution of that covariate, and test uh, if that uh, distribution is independent from the unconstrained from the unconditional distribution d y. Uh, now, the way uh, I can test this um, is very well varies as well. And I'm going to go back to this um, when I explain to you um, the algorithm later. on. OK, so for this work, I used the well label for survey, um, hence why I'm here presenting uh, my work. Um, I used the third quarter corresponding corresponding to July, September 2019. Um, why did I use 2019? Well, what, that was the latest um, data set that I had before COVID hit. I didn't want COVID to uh, get uh, involved in my estimations. And I had to use the third quarter um, P 
people that work with the LFS, uh, uh, sorry, the Labour Force Survey, yes, um, should know this. Um, but because I have uh, in the third quarter, I have variables on social mobility. Now, most of my work uh, is um, following very closely a paper by Brunori et al. 2018. Uh, it's a working paper from the World Bank. Um, so most of the things that I'm going to be doing here and all the um, training of the data um, and the working age for individuals. So I took individuals uh, from 30 years old to 59 um, are, are going to be subject to um, what they did in their paper. Now, this is a much broader paper um, compared to mine. They uh, made an analysis for the whole, uh, for many European countries. They used a data set called SILC, which uh, has uh, homogeneous, homogeneous data for the European countries, which I believe was fed by another survey called Family Resources Survey here in the UK. So instead, I'm going to be using, so just focusing on the UK and using the quarterly labor report survey. The target variable that I'm going to use for my analysis is the average cross hourly pay, which is, as we know, calculated by um, the, o the ONS, uh, depending on uh, the, the respondents by the, the individuals that actually uh, complete the survey. So I dismiss the lower 0 0.5 and upper 99.5 percentage of the distribution just to not deal with outliers. Um, and I'm left with 6,853 observations. So even though the LFS has um, more than 80,000 observations because of all the trimming and because I'm working with uh, individuals in working age, I'm only left with 6,000 or roughly 7,000 observations, which is still a very good uh, um, sample size. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna move forward. With the presentation. Now, this is how the distribution of hourly wages um, look like uh, for that per period that I um, analyzed. Now, what I did here was uh, round it up to two decimal places and then bin them in intervals of 50 pence. So, if we have a look in this this first um, interval here, I have people earning from nine pounds to 9.5. Uh, now, the distribution like looks like something that we would really expect. Uh, most observations are around minimum wage. The median is just about minimum wage, and then it's right skewed, um, as again we would expect. So that's not the median, the dashed line is mean. Uh, for the algorithm, what I did, because I didn't want to use uh, ver this very spiky distribution, I transformed my tar target variable uh, into logs. So all the analysis that we're going to see forward um, are um, with hourly wage, logs of hourly wage. So the core variables that I picked for, for the analysis are both, uh, so given both because of other uh, empirical uh, works have, on opportunities have already used them, and also um, based on the theoretical uh, approach that I had, so uh, Romer's approach to inequality of opportunity. So I have gender, I have some demographics like nationality, ethnicity, and religion. And then a very interesting one that I uh, found for the UK, uh, which I believe I'm the only um, empirical work working with this variable is the number of GCSEs um, a child takes at the age of 16. So for those that are not very acquainted with um, uh, the education system in the UK, GCSEs are exams that uh, children take at the age of 16, which for they prepare for um, roughly two years. So they pick them at the age of 14 and they work for two years and take these exams at the age of 16. Um, I think, so GCSEs are English, uh, in Scotland, uh, I believe they're called national fives, but they're still um, considering my data sets under this uh, uh, variable. Now, um, five of them, I believe, are compulsory. So all of them have to, so children in, in the whole country have to take at least five uh, GCCs. However, we have some children taking more than 10. So um, bear in mind that I'm working with the number of GCCs and not the performance on, on GCCs to capture uh, circumstances. Again, why did I why I picked GCCs and not A-levels uh, is something that we can have a, a chat about at the end of the session, or you can drop me an email and we can discuss it as well. Then we have um, health condition as a variable, which is a long lasting health condition, and then three different variables to capture social mobility. We have household composition, main earner, and occupation of the, of the parent. I think it says parent, but actually um, it is father. Now, unfortunately, I didn't count with uh, education of the father, but um, occupation of the parent is what I have. 
So I'm going to be working with this. I have four minutes. So uh, the distribution of um, this is the distribution of hourly wages in logs um, for males and females, right? So bl the blue line uh, is males, the orange one is females, and that's the difference that we have in means. I'm going to do the same analysis for um, GCSEs, so number of GCSEs. Uh, orange line describes people that take fewer than five GCSEs at the age of 16. And then uh, the blue line people that take more, that took more than five. And this is um, the dis distribu distribution of hourly wages decomposing by uh, the occupation of the parents. So if your father was a manager and professional, you would be in the blue distribution. If your father belonged to a different occupation, you would be in the orange line. So essentially, what I'm going to be testing here is um, if I'm going to be testing statistically in a recursive way um, if these distributions are indeed different. So the algorithm works as follows. Uh, first of all, and as we always do, uh, we will choose a significant levels alpha and then the maximum depth of the tree. So how much splitting I would like my tree to have. Following that, I will test the, the null hypothesis of distribution independence. I'm, I'm going to have this set omega. So set omega uh, is a set of all the possible uh, realizations of uh, my covariates x. So let's say my set of covariates is only gender and occupation of father uh, being professionals and managers. Then my set omega would be gender male, gender female, occupation of father uh, managers, occupation of father professionals. So I'm going to be testing the independence, um, the distribution independence of every um, of every yeah, every element in that set, in that big set, uh, omega. I'm going to pick the p-value of uh, those tests, and then I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to pick the, the one with the smallest one. Now, if the p-value is greater than my significant level, or if I've already reached the maximum depth of the tree, then I'm going to exit the algorithm. If not, I'm going to pick that uh, variable as a splitting variable. Now, the next step would be uh, checking where to draw the line in the splitting, uh, using that splitting variable, okay? So, for example, for occupation of father, once I pick that occupation of father is a very relevant um, uh, uh, covariate to explain the variance in uh, hourly wage. Now I need to decide where that threshold is going to be drawn. So it's going to be drawn at managers. Is it going to be drawn at managers and professionals, managers, professionals and technicians and so on. So that's what I do uh, in the step number four. If again, that new P value is greater than my significant level, then I'm going to dismiss the split and exit. Um, and then otherwise I'm going to keep it. I don't want to repeat the steps until um, I reach the maximum depth of three. Now, this is the opportunity structure that I found for the UK. Um, something that I forgot to mention, let me quickly go back to step number two. The way I'm going to be um, testing for hypothesis, for hypothesis, for sorry, distribution independence uh, um, varies as well. So in one case, I had t-testing, so testing for difference in means. Uh, in, in the second part of my paper, I try Kolmogorov, Smirnov, uh, which goes beyond the mean and test the uh, independence on the whole distribution. Now, the results I'm going to be presenting here, I best are based on t-testing. So what's shown in ellipsis uh, are the, the variables that my algorithm picked as splitting uh, variables and uh, variables worth uh, mentioning because of the, they explain the variance in uh, hourly wage. Now, what's included in the branches of the tree is the threshold that my algorithm drew for um, for the variables. So in these cases, it's just binary options. So it's either male or female, I'm running out of time. Um, same with GCSEs, it's either more than five or fewer than five. But for some variables, um, I, I have different splitting uh, thresholds. And then finally, the square boxes here are um, hourly wages, so the average hourly wage within that group and the number of observations of that subgroup. So if we have a look at the opportunity structure in the UK, the first thing that we observe um, is that for those taking fewer than five uh, GCSEs at the age of 16, health, long in health uh, conditions and nationality seem to matter. Um, interestingly, interestingly, only for females, 
uh, on this left hand side of the of the tree. Uh, occupation of the father seems to be a relevant variable that explains the variance in their income. If we have a look at men, um, so we hear men with long lasting health conditions that took fewer than five GCSEs, they would be earning on average 15.15 pounds an hour, which is greater than 1504, which is how much females that took more than five GCSEs at the age of 16, so allegedly more educated. However, this group of uh, females have parents that come from more uh, disadvantaged backgrounds because their professions are not uh, managers, professionals or technicians. And then the most disadvantaged group uh, in my sample would be um, females, non-British females that took less than five, fewer than five, sorry, GCSEs at the age of 16. These uh, subgroup uh, are earning on average 9.49 pounds per hour, which is less than half of my of what my most privileged uh, group of uh, in this subsample are earning, which is 20.21. And these are men uh, that took more than uh, five GCSEs at the age of 16. Now, this is how the distribution of errors uh, looks like. What I did here was predicting, as I was telling you at the uh, start of this presentation, uh, telling you the, I predicted the um, outcomes for uh, the testing sample, and then I compared that to the true value. Uh, this is how it looks like. All of them seem to be, this is the deviations from the actual uh, value from my predicted value. Again, everything is in logs, um, but it seems to be around zero. So. Um, the differences are not that big. And finally, I'm going to wrap up because I'm running out of time. Um, I think although there's so much more to be done, um, I know there's so many endogeneity issues around this uh, that I did not deal with. There's so many fixed effects that I did not deal with. I think identifying the number of GCSEs and occupation of the, fa uh, the father uh, as, as key uh, circumstances uh, is not trivial. Um, in terms of especially social mobility. Now, um, with respect to the methodology, um, I think I've got, I had a good out of sample accuracy of the estimations given the sample size it was uh, roughly 7,000 and the non-comprehensive set of covariates in the data. Um, I, I would have liked to have uh, more, much more uh, variables to uh, predict and to use in my algorithm. However, I didn't, but I think overall the fit was not uh, that bad. Um, I'm going to wrap it up here because otherwise um, I'm going to extend too much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, so and thank you very nice much. See you all. Thank you very much, all you special speakers. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.